Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm not much of a poet, but I've got a wordsmith for you. As you may have gathered, April is National Poetry Month, and I'm honored to have Shuli Kaywood as my very special guest today. Shuli is the author of Trouble Can Be So Beautiful at the Beginning, Poems, a stunning collection that won Mercer University Press's prestigious Adrian Bond Award for Poetry. Her other works include the short story collection A Small Thing to Want, which won the 2021 Independent Publisher Bronze Medal for Short Fiction, The Memoir, The Going, and The Goodbye, and A Small Book of Advice, 52 Things I Wish I Could Have Told Myself When I Was 17. Shuli has an MFA in creative writing from Queen's University and teaches a variety of writing workshops. She also holds an MA in journalism from The Ohio State University and contributes columns to the Johnson City Press and The News and Neighbor. Her creative fiction has been included in anthologies and featured in forums including The New York Times, The Sun, and Brevity. But back to trouble can be so beautiful at the beginning. Melissa Fight Johnson, author of Green, said, The poems are more than poems. They are old photos in a family album, handwritten recipes in a tin box. In this beautiful collection, Kaywood examines what it means to be human, the places that hold us, the people we lose. Each poem, its small, still words a sigh of ink, helps us recognize who we are and remember who we used to be. Kaywood's words are soft as water, stronger than an undertow. Her poems are time machines, love letters, maps marked up with stars. Now, Shuli Kaywood, ever delightful and discerning, invites us into her world of words and offers a special reading from Trouble Can Be So Beautiful at the Beginning. Hey everybody, welcome back to Central Book. I am honored and thrilled to be celebrating National Poetry Month, which is April, if you haven't gathered, with award-winning author Shuli Kaywood, who is sort of a jack of all trades, or maybe it's a Jill of all trades. I know that you will, you know, disagree with me about that, but I say you can pretty much do anything. And if you haven't done it yet, you probably will. It's just you know, it'll happen. But anyway, your poetry collection is Trouble Can Be So Beautiful at the Beginning, which is such a compelling title and what a beautiful cover this is. Um, but welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I know I've been looking forward to having you here and I feel like I, I poached you from our good friend, the Book Cougars, but I <laughs> promise you can have her back, <laughs> you know. It's been a long time in the making. Um, but anyway, so I did want to start with poetry and then we'll discuss things a bit more broadly because you sort of write all over the map, which I absolutely love. But like I mentioned, it's National Poetry Month, so that seems to be a pretty good place to start. And you can tell me I don't understand poetry at all as we get into it because I, pro I probably don't. I probably but, don't either, so hey. <laughs> well, I like that. Oh. But, you know, I've been thinking and talking to some people and reading things online, and I feel like the definition of poetry has become really so expansive, you know, and in looking online, there's something like 160 some odd recognized forms of poetry. There's free verse, so really it can almost be whatever you want it to be, which I think can be sort of both liberating and almost crippling in the fact that it, it's that vast. So can you tell me, what is your definition of poetry? What is poetry to you? Wow, I have never been asked this question before. Um, poetry, I guess I, I've never thought of a definition that uh, I, I've never had to come up with a definition. Hey, why define it, right? I guess maybe the moral of this story is there really is no definition and whatever it used to be, it's probably not anymore and tomorrow it'll be something different, whatever well, you need to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I, poet, there's so much, as you said, different poetry that's out there. And that's one of the things I love about it. I've never had a definition for poetry um, that I use. I write for my own self. I write poems that tell a story, but all poetry doesn't have to tell a story. And so for myself, I'm always looking for my own poetry to be some lines that create a moment, that distill a moment, and that go beyond the depth of just the surface. And so that's what I use as my own definition, working definition, but it is not a definition for other people's poetry. That's just how I use it for myself. And my sure, I think that's very fair. I appreciate that perspective. 
All right, so let me ask you this. I'm wondering what you can recall of sort of your discovery of poetry and poets. I don't know how far back your memory goes, but can you tell us, you know, what you remember first speaking to you and what speaks to you now? And then if you found that the relationship with poetry has changed throughout the years. Yeah, my first really strong memories of poetry were in school. Um, definitely in uh, junior high, I was learning, reading short stories and learning about poetry. And then in high school, my huge strong memory is of working with uh, someone named Don Wallace. He was the editor of our local newspaper and he chose to volunteer to come into the high school and work with students to write poems, to talk about poems. And he created a literary magazine for us. And I remember reading my peers' work, um, writing my own, and just being really taken with poetry. I've been taken with poetry ever since then. So, and I commend Don Wallace. He's the one who really, I think, brought that into my life in such a huge, impactful way when I was a uh, high schooler. And so I've been reading poetry and writing poetry ever since then. And in terms of how it's changed over the years, well, I hope that I've read a lot more widely since I was in high school and I was mostly focused on little relationship poems and my, my, just the poems of my peers. And so what I read is uh, many different types of poetry and it's just expanded and expanded over the years. And my writing has too, I hope, so. I, I tell you, I'm sure, I know, you know, I haven't read you as a high schooler, but I, I feel like if you were writing, you know, like this at a high school level, then you were just some kind of prodigy. Um, but it is funny that you would go back to high school because I think that, you know, we feel things so deeper, deeply and differently in that adolescent age. And I remember too, you know, when I was in high school, we did this whole sort of poetry segment in our creative writing classes and the teacher would always say that it was always the student's favorite part of the year and her least favorite because it was just all so, so depressing. It's like yeah well high school in general is a pretty depressing time in my life. Yeah it's very angst ridden and when I look back I still have some of the work that my peers wrote from back then and I still love some of their work but it's very we all wrote very angst ridden poems <laughs> so <laughs> Like the dark times, the dark period. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So let me ask you this then. Um, in your opinion, because I know that this is very, very subjective, but what makes a poem resonate with or work for you? And I'm talking both in terms of what you enjoy reading and then also your own writing style, which I think you sort of touched upon briefly earlier. I really like poems that tell a story and that's the kind of poem that I write most of the time as well. I like a poem that has a turn at the end. So I'm always looking for that when I read other people's work and I'm, and I'm trying to have that happen in my own work where there's some sort of turn that it takes towards the end of the poem that is a surprise maybe. And I'm not talking about like fire truck coming out of, of the, around from around the corner, but just some sort of turn or insight. And that's the kind of poetry I love to read. Um, and so I'm always looking for that. Sure. So you've read some of my poems. There's always a fire. I've read all of them, John. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is the common theme. Every poem, there's a fire truck. There you go. There See? you go. All right. So let me ask you this. And again, some of these questions are really subjective. I don't know if they're necessarily fair, but you know, you give great perspective. So I'm just gonna keep on asking you all these strange things. But I'm wondering, you know, if you can tell me what your relationship was like is like with inspiration, or if you feel that it's inspiration or a muse versus actually just work. Um, and also, do you find that the makings of your poetry are conscious, subconscious, or more sort of a combination of the two? That's a, those are great questions. So we'll start with the first one. Oh, well, let's start with the second one because I'm probably gonna have to, you'll have to remind me what the first one was, but about the, whether they're subconscious. So I have really worked on in the last two years probably with writing when I sit to write to really let my mind wander wherever it wants to go. And it can go to weird places. Um, I'll write down weird lines that, and I just go with it. And I'm now so practiced in it. I like to just let loose on the page and see where the writing takes me because that is 
for me, not knowing what's gonna, I'm gonna put on the page is half the fun. Actually, it's most of the fun is the surprise that you get. If I, I'm not a person who loves to know what I'm gonna write and sit down and write it. That's not interesting to me and I don't ever do it. So whether it's fiction, poetry, nonfiction, I'm always waiting to be surprised and not knowing where I'm going. And like I said, that's what makes it really fun. So I've found that I am much better the last couple of years at just letting my mind go where it needs to go in terms of writing a poem. I write a poem every morning. They're not good poems, many of them, but I do write something every morning and I love to just see where my mind goes. So that's an answer to that question, but you had the first question. Can you go back to it and remind me? Yeah, you asked? know, I think you may have <laughs> answered it. I mean, I love that you sort of just are free with letting, well, I don't know if inspiration is the right term, but do you feel like inspiration comes for you or the muse or is it just sitting there and waiting for something to strike and say, all right, that's the thing that's moving me today? I think it's both for me. Um, I write I, I write a poem every day. So, and the muse is often, you know, asleep in the other end of the <laughs> house, and not helping me at all. Um, and that's fine. Um, so, but sometimes I will be inspired. I'll have a line come to me or an idea come to me, and then I just start writing. So I am inspired a lot of times. But I also have created my own inspiration. I run a prompt writing workshop every Tuesday. And, and in that workshop, I'm taking a poem of somebody else's and we read it together. And then I, do, I create a prompt that's somehow related to that poem. So I'm always on the internet looking for new poems to use in those workshops. And I never give my workshop participants a prompt without ever having tried it myself. So a lot of weekday mornings, I'm looking at a poem that I loved and going, what kind of prompt can I do related to this? Can it be something related to the title that this uh, poet had? Can it be something about the subject matter? Let's say it's a poem that's about a father. Then maybe I might have them write about fathers. Um, and so I'm always trying my own prompt first. And so that gets me going. I see if it works. And so that's not a that's not inspiration. It's just, you know, doing what I'm asking my, my uh, participants to do. So it's really a combination um, for me. Sure. That's fair. I love that. I like that you, you know, have that choice and you recognize that because I feel like sometimes people just, you know, the muse isn't there. It's just not happening today. But so it's not happening today. That's all right. Maybe it'll happen tomorrow. And I think you just gave me the name of my memoir. And it's going to be something like, I am a morning person, but my creative muse is not. Like, isn't that <laughs> telling? <laughs> and it's so true. If I just waited to be inspired, I probably wouldn't write that often. Um, not that life doesn't inspire me, but I find that I really just have to push myself to try. Um, and I, I am still a writer who says that you don't have to write every day. I just choose to write a poem every morning because it's, it's my favorite way to start the day, even if it's a terrible poem. I just love having written something every single morning. And it's, it's just part of my life now. I think that's terrific. I might have to try that, you know, coffee and a poem or something. Or tweet, That's exactly you know. what I do. And people will say, I, I, I don't have time for that. And literally, I will take some mornings, two minutes to write a not very good poem. But I wrote, I wrote a poem, right? It's technically a poem. So I just don't try to put a lot of judgment on myself for how, like, I don't care whether it's good or not. I mean, it would be nice to write a, a you know, a Pulitzer Prize winning poem every morning. But <laughs> As long as I write something, like, good. That's a great way to start the day, and it's easy. I was going to say, I think that sets a great tone for the day. All right, so, you know, speaking of not making judgments, I'm going to open a whole can of worms right now, probably, but it's just something I've been interested in because I feel like, you know, one of the great debates in poetry concerns what's accessible versus what's mm -hmm. abstract, or maybe, you know, emotional writing versus intellectual writing. So I just, I was wondering if you have opinions on that, because I have to say one thing that I really love about your poetry is it's profound, it's poignant, but I also understand what you're saying, and so I feel like I'm that much more likely to relate to it. Like, I'm not the world's smartest man by any means. I'm not the world's stupidest man, hopefully. But there is just a lot of poetry that I don't understand. And if I don't understand, I can't connect to it. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts on that. I have a lot of thoughts on that. And That's wonderful. I, there's a lot of poetry I do not understand. And a lot of that poetry is winning awards. And that's fine. That's fine. That That's the way it is. Um, but I don't enjoy reading it. Um, 
I don't want something so simple that I get no, you know, there's no complexity to it. I like things that are complex, but I want to be able to read it and at least be able to grasp what it's about. When I read something and I, and I have no idea remotely what a piece is about, it just isn't particularly fun for me. And maybe other people enjoy that. And so I like a piece that is accessible, that I can understand it. And I love it if it um, teaches me something that is outside of my experience. That's wonderful. Um, so it doesn't even have to be something that I've experienced, but I love a poem that is accessible to hopefully a wide range of people and that does have complexity. It goes to a deep place and um, that I walk away feeling a little changed for it. Um, but I'm, I'm like you, there's a lot of poetry out there that I don't understand. And, and, and frankly, I just don't read it. I find wonderful poets whose work that I understand and love. Um, one great resource for that, which I'm going to uh, tout on here, is The Sun magazine. I love the poems that they publish. Um, and they are my favorite uh, magazine to find poetry in. Sure. No, thank you for that. I think a lot of people are going to actually find that very comforting. I mean, I have some friends who write ridiculously good poetry. Um, like I read it and just think, oh, never will I ever even come close to writing something half as good. <laughs> um, and they'll get so, you know, discouraged because they'll submit it and get rejected and then read what was published. And it's a lot of times it is something that it's like, all right, I just, I don't even have the faculty to make sense of that. So I think knowing that you yourself are an award-winning poet, that that might give some people hope and I'm all about hope these days. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I will say there, I won't name names, but there are some, you know, big literary magazines out there that publish pieces and I have subscribed to them and I recently unsubscribed. I had to call to cancel my subscription and they said, why are you uh, canceling? And I said, your magazine is not meant for me. Mm. You know, like I don't understand most of it. So you know, no thanks, but someone out there loves it and that's fine. Right. I mean, you know, writing is so subjective, just like there are genres for different people and there is certainly, you know, you'll, any book you read, someone's gonna hate it, someone's gonna love it. And so I love that there's enough out there that someone can love all that, even if it's not me. <laughs> I love other poems that maybe someone doesn't like. Sure, again, there we go with subjectivity, but I, I totally agree with that because, you know, when I read something, I want to enjoy it and relax. I don't want my mind to hurt any more than it already did. <laughs> but anyway, so I do want to come to your collection uh, for a minute. Trouble can be so beautiful at the beginning. Uh, I just, I wanted to ask you, one, how do you go about assembling a collection? Because these are not things that you're writing thinking that the end goal is necessarily a book where they're all collected together. So what would you say are the common threads or themes throughout this book, despite the fact that the pieces in and of themselves are very much disparate? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll tell you how I went about it. I don't know if, if it's the official way. <laughs> so I looked um, at two kind of things when I was assembling the collection. One is I looked at when I wrote them and sort of looked at kind of place them. I, I literally printed them all out and had them all on the, on the carpet and trying to move them around. Mm -hmm. And so looked at chronologically where they fell in my life or rather the poem's subject fell in my life. So if I was writing, let's say I'm writing about something that happened to me when I was 25, then I would put that in the 25 range rather than I just wrote it yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. And so because I like to have, even in a poetry collection, somewhat of a narrative arc. Um, where you see some movement in the character <laughs> or, you know, whoever the speaker is who's in these poems, but that there is some sort of vague narrative arc just because I write narrative poetry too. So I like that. And then I looked thematically at what I wrote about. And so I grouped them into themes. I write a lot about love. I write a lot about family. I had a lot of poems about Mexico and about my, the Mexican side of my family because I'm half Mexican. And so I didn't want all of those poems to be like lumps, you know, so I tried to, you know, like, I didn't want someone to go, oh, here's, you know, 10 poems about love in a row. So kind of trying to disperse them, but then keeping that a general narrative. When I say a narrative arc, it's not like, you know, not like a fictional character <laughs> where they, you know, there's a, a big plot. But, um, but generally, those are the two things I looked at, sort of an overarching movement. And then um, thematically, did I disperse it enough? that uh, there aren't big lumps. That's how I did it. 
Sure. That's fascinating. And, you know, hearing that makes me want to reread the book, and I probably will just because I think, you know, hearing that will enable me to read it in a different way and probably get something completely different out of it, which, again, I love. You know, you bring a different set of eyes, and all of a sudden you're experiencing something in a totally different way, even though you've already enjoyed it. So, you know, sequel to come, I will let you know how that goes for me. <laughs> <laughs> And also, so I have to ask if you wouldn't mind sharing this story, and hopefully I'm remembering it correctly. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, this collection did win an award. It was the Adrian Bond Award for Poetry um, from Mercer University Press. And if I'm recalling correctly, you almost weren't even certain that you were going to submit it for that <laughs> award. And then Emily Fine, who is half of the book cougars with Chris Bullock, kind of said you have to. So can you share that story oh, for those yeah. people who aren't necessarily yeah. confident in their work? You know, that sometimes you just have to put it out there and take that chance. That's true. I saw this call for submissions. I Let me back up to say I was interested in Mercer University Press. I came across them at an um, AWP conference um, and saw their table of works and so became interested in them and had actually talked to them about submitting my short story collection to them. And... I ended up finding a publisher for that short story collection and then saw this call for this contest for a poetry collection. And whatever the description had, based on the description, I thought my work doesn't fit in with what they're looking for. And I happened to mention this to Emily Fine uh, and she said, oh no, you're submitting it. <laughs> she said, you need to, you just need to try. Um, there's no point not trying, which is funny because I say that to my students <laughs> all the time. And I just, uh, even today, I, I uh, ran a workshop on submitting to literary magazines and submitting things. And I said, don't ever count yourself out. And I, it's hard to do that sometimes for yourself. And so I took Emily's advice and I thought, you know, oh, so what if it's a long shot? I'm still going to submit it. She's right. And um, lo and behold, it won the contest. It still amazes me to this day that it did, but I'm really, really happy. It was a wonderful, wonderful piece of news. Yeah, how great is that? And now you have this cool little sticker, you know, on here. So everybody knows, but that's such a wonderful story. And, you know, like you, I think a lot of times I give decent advice to people. And then I think I don't, you know, I don't take that advice myself, but there's probably something smart in there. All right. Anyway, so... <laughs> You mentioned your short story collection, a uh, <laughs> small thing to want, stories, there it is, look at that. Um, also, look, another award winner, I love to point these things out. <laughs> But, you know, you. I just wanted to say I was reading this this weekend and, you know, I already adore your work, but there happened to be a story where you name dropped Gloria Estefan, who is like my religion. So, <laughs> you know, I just figured I would take a moment and say, hey, because if somebody gave me, you know, I think it was flowers and two tickets to a Gloria show to, you know, pacify a person, I would forgive anything. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for that. <laughs> okay, so, you know, as you mentioned, you sort of, you write all over the map, which I absolutely love. So in addition to poetry, you know, we talked about short stories. You do flash fiction, nonfiction. Um, you've done memoir. So I'm wondering if you can talk about, you know, the differences and similarities. How does working on one influence your relationship with another and do you know what you're setting down to write, you know, or is that deadline driven? I don't know if that question made any sense. Yeah, I think it did, or at least <laughs> my version of it does. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but you asked a lot of questions in there. So I'm going to try to sort through, I'm going to start with the last one because that's the only one I tend to remember and then you have to go back and remember. I'm terrible at giving two-part questions. <laughs> Let me break it down for you again. Um, because, yeah, I do that and then I'm like, John, don't do <laughs> So, you know, first part of the question was just basically you write things, you know, that can be very, very different, fiction, nonfiction, things that are very personal to you, things that might not be. So do you find that writing those different things informs how you approach, you know, other things? Like, does your nonfiction inform how you approach fiction and vice versa? I would say that my fiction, uh, well, so I would say nonfiction's in the middle, memoir. My memoir and poetry writing often will kind of overlap. I, I write about a, a lot of the same themes in both of those. 
And I would also say that um, sometimes I don't know if I'm writing a prose poem versus uh, a piece of memoir or personal essay. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll take a piece that is all true uh, about myself and might try it as a poem and see if that works. So a lot of times those cross over. And then uh, fiction, I'm not writing about my life, but definitely there are so many things that I have learned in fiction uh, and nonfiction that cross over. I mean, they're, they're, other than one being true and one not, there's so much that crosses over with you know, wanting to grab a reader's attention, pull them into a story, um, seeing that story get resolved, um, character being developed, even in personal essays, uh, at least the kind I write, there's character development in there, um, especially with memoir. So they definitely have uh, crossovers in terms of what I, how one informs the other. Um, and I've just learned so much. I mean, you take a fiction class and I can apply so many of the things to nonfiction and even to poetry. In my MFA program, we study four things, four areas. We studied fiction, nonfiction, uh, playwriting and screenwriting and poetry. And even if I was learning, like I knew nothing about screenwriting and playwriting, but there was always something that I could use in my work somehow and that made me see my own work differently. So I think you read any good piece of writing and hopefully you'll get something about it uh, from it that'll apply to your writing in some way. That's sure. And, the writing. Yeah. And so let me ask you this, you know, being successful in so many different areas and sort of having a lot of skills to draw from when you sit down to write, I know you mentioned in the morning, you know, you just, you sort of let it come, but and I'm sure some of this might be, you know, if you're driven by deadlines or things that you know are going to be published, but, you know, do you sit, ever sit down with the expectation, okay, today I'm writing fiction, today I'm writing memoir, today I'm writing poetry, or is it really always just waiting to see what channels through you? It's, it's both, but there, there are deadlines, or sometimes I just miss fiction. It's what I'm writing the least right now. Um, so some days I will say, okay, let's start a short story, and start in the middle of nowhere. I never know where a short story is going. Just try to get a character doing something at the start of the, of the, of the story, um, right on the page and see where it goes. So it can't, it, it often is intentional. Right now I'm trying to put together a flash nonfiction manuscript. Mm -hmm. So I've been more intentional about trying to write flash nonfiction. Um, so it, it is often intentional. But just the poem a day is the only thing that just I just let come however it wants to come, but it's always a poem. <laughs> sure. No, that's terrific. All right. So let me ask you this, you know, and speaking of fiction and nonfiction, I've spoken to a lot of people, you know, who write both um, and very competently. And some people have said that they actually find that there's more truth or more reality in their fiction, not intentionally necessarily, than in their memoir or their nonfiction, just because the memoir or the nonfiction might be a very specific memory or a narrow time frame. Um, but they're, they find that they might be creating, you know, so, sort of more essential truths in their fiction, if not necessarily you know, literary truths, literal truths. Uh, do you find that when you're writing fiction that parts of you sneak in there and you say, oh yeah, I can really relate to that even though other people probably wouldn't recognize it? Yes, I, I, I've always said that there's always, almost always a kernel of truth in fiction. That could take different forms. It could be that I'm writing about someone who has a job that I've had, but they're, you know, what the plot line is is totally different. I've never experienced it, but there's still that little like, You've, or it's set in a town that I've been in or that I grew up in, um, even though everything that happens in the plot is nothing that I've experienced. But I always think there's just a little bit of truth and a little part of me in every uh, fiction story. But again, oftentimes it is not the plot, it's something else. Uh, like I, I was very shy as a kid, so I might write a, 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 a story with someone who's shy. So something like that. Um, there are only, in that collection that you have, there are two stories that actually came from my life and they're the only two in the collection that I couldn't remember the details well enough to write them as memoir. I wanted them to go into my memoir, but I am a believer as a memoir writer. I don't believe you should make things up and make up dialogue that happen. Right. It should be true to your memory. And I just didn't have enough memory of those two incidents to put them in my memoir. So I ended up writing fiction. And once I did that, then 
already said I'm a person who likes surprises. I didn't write it the way it happened either. The characters took on their own, you know, they have their own lives and their own personalities and the stories ended quite differently than how my life ended, but the beginnings of them were what happened to me. And then I kind of set them in motion on the page. Sure, other that's... than that, there are only the only two stories in that collection that are pretty true to my life. Sure. That's interesting. So now we're all going to go, you know, reread that collection and take bets on which two are the ones that came from real life. <laughs> but, you know, so moving on. So I wanted to ask you too, I, I am going to say that in addition to all this wonderful writing that you do, you are also a pro prolific doodler. If I can mm. coin that term, I don't know if that's a term or not, but I'd rather be a pro prolific doodler than a diddler. So anyway, you know, I wanted to ask you because I love, you know, your doodles, and this is just something that you sent me, but I mean, you have postcards, you have all these wonderful imagery, um, and this actually says imagination is everything, which I think is very beautiful and profound, but let me ask you about visual arts, you know, because doodling is obviously a much different thing than writing, so can you talk about what you gain, you know, from that form of creative expression? And also, do you find that it sort of, you know, gives you a way back into other forms of creative expression if you take time out to do this kind of visual art? Yeah, that's a, those are great questions. I started doodling. Okay, well, let me start by saying, I've always said, I can't do anything visual. I'm, I, I said, it, I can't even do a stick figure well is what I've always said my whole life. And then the pandemic hit and I got blocked with my writing. I was really having a, a difficult time and I really wanted to try something different. I was lucky enough to be able to do that, um, to take some time to try uh, doing something different. So I took a class, it was a Skillshare class on doodling and it was like a five session class. It was really short. And it was on how to begin doodling because I didn't really know how to do that. And so the thing that she did was she didn't show you, this is how you draw a circle. But what she did was she allowed the students um, to know that it was okay to doodle whatever turned out. So she had us drawing like ourselves on the page. And I was like, this is not gonna turn out well, but I'm gonna trust that it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And so she really taught me permission to allow myself to do whatever I wanted to, which is great for writing too. That has helped me open up my brain to not worry about judging it so much. And so I started doodling, just having fun. And for me, it really did help uh, unblock me in my writing. And I find with doodling, I'm just so, again, non-judgmental. I just doodle whatever I want. There's oftentimes, I used to post things on social media. I hardly ever even do that anymore. I'm just doodling for the heck of it. Mm -hmm. And I do think there's something to fun um, that has no purpose and that really focuses you. And that's what doodling does. It really focuses me and I get lost in it and it's pure fun. It's not gonna go anywhere. Like nobody's gonna see this. Um, so it's wonderful. And I think those kind of creative outlets we often think of as, well, what's the purpose? There's no use to this. Um, it's not going to make money. It's not going to do something for someone else. I mean, it's a purely selfish act to do. <laughs> and I think there's something to all that creativity where it's just you get lost in it and it's just for fun. And I think it does help with other other areas of your creativity. Definitely. It helped me. I love that. And yeah, sometimes you just have to give yourself permission to do it and say, hey, I might not be great at it, but who knows, maybe I'll get something out right. of it. That's, and like you, I cannot draw a stick figure to save my life. It's kind of tragic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and true, you're That's learning okay. way more than you need to know about me. Uh, <laughs> you know, a few more questions. Take the doodling class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need to, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, you've mentioned that you uh, teach all kinds of different workshops. And, you know, having taken one myself, I can say that they're really engaging, they're dynamic, they're fun. And I want to ask you, and again, this is kind of one of those can of worm questions, but having that experience, what do you think can be taught of the craft versus what somebody has that's intrinsic talent? And then how can discipline or tenacity really play into that? Those are, those are great questions. I think there's a lot that can be learned. Um, for writing. I think 
yeah, I just think there's so much craft that can be taught if someone is open enough to it and is willing to try. A lot of people um, might find it, you know, might want to not take advice from people um, and say, you know what, I don't really want to try uh, changing how I title or trying this different style. And no, 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 I just want to stay. And it's fine to, I mean, I always say people should write for themselves first. And so if their goal isn't to become a better writer or to become uh, published in some way or, or to have their writing change, then I, I, it's fine. I mean, I, I love people people who just write for themselves have no, uh, don't want to have it published and they just do it to have fun, like I doodle. And I think that's wonderful. I really wanted to see my craft grow and change. And so I was always looking at trying to improve it. How can I make it better? And I wouldn't be the writer I am today without so many lessons and teachers who helped pull my writing along uh, over many, many years. So I think a lot can be taught. Um, and I, I love students who are open to those kinds of things and open to trying things, just see. Um, I've taken different types of poems that I don't write at all and I'll look at the style and I'll say, why don't I just try it? Why not? You know, why not just try the style that this poet used or this essayist used? Let me try the form that they, that they have shown me and see if it works. And maybe it might fail miserably, but, <laughs> but you have fun trying, right? And you learn something. So I think a lot of craft can be taught. That was a long-winded way of saying that. No, absolutely. Um, That's great. And I love too that you bring so much of others' works, you know, into your classes. So it's not like this is how Shuli Kaywood does it. It's like this is how right. all of these people do it. And right. it's very sort of a vast landscape, which is terrific because again, hopefully, you know, you find something that resonates with you because you get that spectrum. So just a few more questions for you, but I did want to ask you specifically about um, one of the topics you teach, because I think it's really, really interesting. And the concept behind it is to let your title, you know, do some of the heavy lifting mm. of the piece, which I'm sure, you know, really plays into something like a poem. But I'm wondering if you can speak to that briefly and maybe use some examples yeah. from your own work, either your books or singular poems to sort of illustrate the point. Well, that's also a good question. So one of the things that I noticed was there were pieces that I loved, uh, other people's work that I loved, and I started to notice how they were using titles. And some people will have a wonderful piece and it doesn't have a very strong title. Um, you might see a, I always use the example, someone might write a poem about an apple orchard and they title it Apple Orchard. <laughs> to me, that's not the title is doing nothing. Uh, it's just saying what this is like. It's like the subject is, like starting an essay with the subject is, I'm gonna be writing about crayons today. And then here's my introductory paragraph. And so I started noticing titles that drew me in. I started noticing titles that just did something different with the piece. And then I started applying that to my own work. I think I, I know I used to hate, I used to hate titling my work. I just, I wanted to do away with it and I would dread it. And then when I started studying titles and studying what interests me and what are authors doing here? Like, I love this title. What did they do here? Um, then I started really enjoying titling my work and saying, how can I add some sort of dimension to my piece from the title um, rather than just putting apple orchard at the top, like, right? Maybe I write about an apple orchard and I call it um, the day after I uh, lost my cousin in a fire, right? And that would totally change your reading of this apple orchard scene, right? Um, because now, even though the cousin isn't mentioned and the fire isn't mentioned during the, the poem, you have that as the overlay to go into it. That kind of title is doing a ton of work for the piece, right? That apple orchard piece. So I just, I love teaching it and I like applying it to my own work. I, I don't know that I always do it so well, but, um, but I try really hard um, sure. to just make an interesting title that adds some sort of dimension to the piece. No, I love that. And it just, again, it kind of shifts your perspective and you really realize how important titles are or can be. Um, so I know I think about them differently now after hearing you speak about it, which is fun. Um, all right, so last two questions for you, and I ask this of everybody, but here we go. For people who are seeking advice, you know, on a writing life or a creative life more broadly. So what do you think is the best advice that you were ever given in terms of that? And then the best advice that you were never given and had to learn for yourself throughout the process of actually doing it? 
advice that I was given was definitely to, to write and keep trying and to believe in myself. I was lucky enough to have teachers and mentors very early on who believed in my writing. And so I've always believed in myself as a writer, even if I wasn't a very good one, I still believed that I could do it. And that was an advice that's carried me through. I remember in graduate school, um, someone didn't let me into her, a po professor didn't let me into a poetry uh, seminar um, because she didn't think my poetry was good enough. And I didn't let that stop me from writing poetry. And I found another teacher who said, yeah, come to my seminar and learned so much from him. And so I always remember that piece of advice. And I try to pass that on to my students to never let somebody else decide you're not good enough. Um, and then a piece of writing advice that I feel like I've um, given to myself over the years is to, they say, write what you know. And, and I say, write what you know to find out what you don't know. I think mm -hmm. it's fine to write on a topic that you're familiar with. Like if I wanna set a story in my hometown, it doesn't have to be across the world, right? But I think it's fun to enter writing, to write something into the unknown, which is what I said earlier. I love being surprised. Um, and I always encourage my memoir and essay students to write about, to write with a question in mind and answer it for yourself on the page. If you already know the answer to the question, then memoir typically isn't interesting. You know, it's like you already know what you learned and you're just, you know, putting it down on the page. So I always encourage people to write what they know to find out what they don't know. And explore that. So those are the two uh, pieces of advice. Oh, that's terrific. I love that you said that because I have spoken to some people in the past who said they really don't know what they think about a certain topic until they've actually, you know, taken the time to explore that through writing. And I found that to be true myself on occasion. So that's terrific. All right. So last question. I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned a bit ago that You've been concentrating on short, you know, memoir pieces that you're thinking might become a collection. So can you leave us with a teaser of what comes next? I have three projects in the works. Um, the first is a second poetry collection that is complete. And I'm out there submitting to contests, just kind of really at the beginning process of finding a home for it. Nice. Um, so that is done. I keep adding to it because I re keep writing my poems <laughs> in the morning and every once in a while I get something that'll work and then I edit and keep working on that. It becomes part of the collection, but the collection is already full length as, as it is and I'm submitting it. The second thing is I am three quarters of the way through a flash nonfiction manuscript. And for those of you who don't know, flash nonfiction is short, true stories. So there's stories from my own life uh, that are sh a thousand words or fewer. And um, the kind of stories that I've pulled from my life really range all over the place. So there is no, it's not like all on, you know, Mexico or all on right. my hometown or something. And then uh, the third project I've been working on for probably the longest is a, is a second short story collection. And I keep wanting it to be done and it's just not done. Um, I have uh, this time with my, if you, if you read the collection that you have in your hand this, the, or had in your hands, the small thing to want, a lot of the collection are just separate stories, but um, I don't know if you've gotten to the end, but there are three linked stories at the very yes. end. And so this, and so this <laughs> next collection I've taken um, five, uh, seven, I think it's seven or eight college roommates who lived in a house together and I'm writing about their stories. So going all over their life. So not just, there are some of them in college, but then kind of what happens to some of them. Um, and so they ha each have their individual stories and sometimes the others will pop into their stories. Um, and so I have a lot of it written, but it is never felt complete. I don't know what story still is missing. I have a feeling there are one or two still missing. And so I'm just, it doesn't feel complete for me, even though technically it's the right <laughs> word length. Um, to be able to submit it. And so I'm just, yeah, I'm just kind of feeling my way. I usually go by feel when I, not only length, but a feeling like, is this complete? And it just feels undone right now. So hopefully. Sure, but yeah, well, you've been busy, you know, three projects, all this teaching, all the other things you do. <laughs> I, and still you make time to talk to me. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for asking. You ask great questions. I love them. Oh, you're so kind. I've just babbled incoherently a lot today. Apparently, I woke up too early and three cups of coffee was not enough. <laughs> but 
But I have to remind people that they need to pick up Trouble Can Be So Beautiful at the beginning, which is out right now. It is such a beautiful collection. And I should remind people, too, that they really need to check out your website because if they are interested in taking any of the classes that you do online, they can find a list of all of them and find the one that is right for them. And really, it is a great range of topics. So there is something that will speak to you. I promise you that. Probably a lot of things. But Shuli Kaywood, thank you so much for celebrating National Poetry Month with us. Thank you so much for having me. And I did love the questions you asked. They were fabulous. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shuli Kaywood, and I'm reading today from my new poetry collection, Trouble Can Be So Beautiful at the Beginning. I'm going to be reading a poem entitled, Katy Perry is Crooning and Won't Stop Just Because I Did. Because this is a small village and people tell other people's news, I already know when I walk past your mother's house and the garage door is flung open wide, as if it got stopped mid-scream and you are lining up the contents on the lawn, an artificial Christmas tree, boards that once belonged to shelves, that your brother died 15 hours ago in the early hours of morning, that he had trouble breathing because of flu or because of some other condition, the coroner will discover. I will learn about that too surely when the news comes because this is how a village runs, on private information, on what really happened, on what maybe happened, and especially if it's bad news, we pass it along like hot potatoes so it won't burn our knowing hands. And in this way, perhaps, it might not happen to us, not in the same way or not so badly. I pause at the edge of your lawn and pull out my earbuds. Katy Perry is crooning and won't stop just because I did. And tell you I heard about what happened, and I'm sorry, and you are startled because we have never talked to one another. But as happens in a small town, I know who you are, and you know who I am, by name anyway. And you have forgotten for a moment the way a village runs, on recognition and proximity. We must look each other in the eye if we are to ever look at ourselves. You don't know what crises I have lived through, for I moved away and am only back now. And it isn't really fair that I know about your brother today, and it isn't fair that we are both alive, and that his silver grand marquee sits with a cold engine in the driveway, and it isn't fair that after I have expressed my sorrow for your loss, I can step back on the sidewalk and off your lawn. I can slip the earbuds back in, and there will be Katy Perry, still singing, and if I want her to start up again, all I have to do is push rewind, which I won't, but I could, while you are left with the contents of the garage laid out on the lawn, and you won't be able to put any of it back, but you can't leave it out either in the rain that is coming down already. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.